Hello, welcome back to Astronomy. This is chapter 14 on our star, which of course is the sun. And this video is part three, solar activity. Our goals for learning, what causes solar activity and how does solar activity vary with time? So first, what causes solar activity? Solar activity is like weather on Earth. It includes such things as sunspots, solar flares, solar prominences, and coronal mass ejections. And in this video, I'm gonna describe these four phenomena. All these phenomena are related to magnetic fields in the sun. First, there's sunspots. Sunspots are dark regions on the sun, these spots that Galileo first noticed when he turned a telescope to the sun. They are cooler regions than the surface of the sun. Remember that the surface, otherwise known as the photosphere, is a temperature of about 5,800 Kelvin. And these are regions that are a bit cooler, about 4,000 Kelvin. They are regions with strong magnetic fields. This diagram represents magnetic field lines. The pink curves are magnetic lines coming out of the surface of the sun. Magnetic field lines represent the directions in which compass needle would point. So if you take a compass for navigation on Earth, the needle points towards our North Pole. It's actually pointing along the line of a magnetic field line. When the lines are closer together, that indicates a stronger magnetic field. And one thing that magnetic fields do is they accelerate electrically charged particles like electrons and protons. So if you look down at the lower right of the diagram, here's an electron, and being electrically charged, it follows in a spiraling path along the magnetic field line. So if you have these magnetic field lines coming out of the surface of the sun, electrons will spiral around them and travel along it like a roller coaster. And so here is a diagram near the surface of the sun. Here we have the convection zone right below the photosphere. And remember the convection zone is where hot gas rises and it gets towards the surface and it cools down and then it falls down. So you have all this bubbling churning material on the sun, these charged particles, which is basically hydrogen nuclei and electrons. And this represents the surface, so there's the photosphere. And remember, the photosphere is a temperature of about 5,800 Kelvin. Now, what happens if you have magnetic field line, and this is what it would look like, it would come out of the surface of the sun into the chromosphere and then go back in. And if you have that, then it's possible that these charged particles, they rise up they cool off, so now it's here right where that sunspot is. It cools off, but instead of falling back down, it's trapped by the magnetic field. So where the magnetic field is intersecting with the surface of the sun, those cooler particles get trapped. Now some of them do travel along like the roller coaster, but some of them are just trapped there, and so it's a cooler region. By the way, 4,000 Kelvin uh, it's going to make it darker than the surface of the sun. And when you look at it through the telescope, when you see sunspots, they look brown, sometimes black. But actually, 4,000 Kelvin is hot enough to emit red. It's just that it is uh, the light of it is so overwhelmed by the brightness of the rest of the surface of the sun, it looks dark. It looks brown or black to us. Over to the right, this X-ray photo shows hot gas trapped within the looped magnetic field lines. So there it is spiraling around. Loops of bright gas often connect sunspot pairs. And so you can see in this diagram here, there's a sunspot and there's a sunspot. Often, not always, but often they appear in pairs. One sunspot where the magnetic field emerges from the surface and then another one where it goes back in. On this picture, shown with Jupiter and Earth for size comparison, the sun has unusually large sunspot activity. And so you notice that this whole sunspot region is about the size of Jupiter. Now 
Now going beyond sunspots, there are other solar phenomena. Magnetic activity causes solar flares that send bursts of X-rays and charged particles into space. So a flare is this bursting forth of energy that takes charged particles with it. Notice that it's X-ray. Magnetic activity also causes solar prominences that erupt high above the sun's surface. So these loops coming out, these are solar prominences. They're, they're pretty short-lived, so they, they burst out and then they fall back down. Throughout this video, I'm describing the weather that's on the sun. And the sun has storms, just like Earth's atmosphere has storms. Magnetic fields can undergo sudden changes producing these intense solar storms. And a very intense storm is called a solar flare, which is what you see in the video. Solar flares emit bursts of ultraviolet and X-ray and charged particles. So here is a prominence erupting, and it's also a solar flare. And there is planet Earth in size comparison. This next phenomenon is called a coronal mass ejection, or CME. It sends bursts of energetic charged particles out throughout the solar system. Now in this picture, the sun itself has been blocked out. The white circle in the middle is representing the size of the sun. But you can see this, uh, this flare with this coronal mass ejection, how big it is compared to the sun. Now this name, coronal mass ejection, let's look at, uh, let's break it down, see what it means. Coronal means it's, uh, it's from the corona, which is the outer layer of the sun. Mass means it's not just energy, it's not just X-ray or ultraviolet, but we're talking about actual particles that burst forth. And ejection, uh, that's pretty clear, means it's bursting forth and going out into the solar system. And here's another CME. This one shows a coronal mass ejection ripping off a comet's tail. So there it is, the comet with its tail, and the CME comes forth and it just rips the tail off. And of course, the tail regrows because remember from chapter 12 what a comet tail is. It's not a solid structure. It's just the gas that is sublimated and is uh, following away from the sun. This picture shows the sun, the particles coming from the sun in the solar wind and how they interact with Earth's magnetic field. So most solar wind particles are deflected around the planets with strong magnetic fields, such as the Earth. So here it goes here, deflected away. Notice that some of them go, they deflect around, but then go into the North Pole and into the South Pole. And this is the cause of the aurora borealis. So the aurora uh, is the lights in the sky, often called the northern lights. In the southern hemisphere, it's called the southern lights. Charged particles streaming from the sun can disrupt electrical power grids and can disable communication satellites. So when we have uh, a lot of solar flare activity, maybe coronal mass ejections, and these things are coming towards the earth, you might hear about them on the news. On the plus side, you might hear about uh, extensive uh, observation of these northern or southern lights. And that's a good thing, that's a pretty sight. And on the bad side, these particles can disrupt power grids and communication satellites. I wanna show you Something like what Galileo first noticed when he was looking at the sun through a telescope. I want to show you about eight weeks of solar observation. Here I have two side-by-side -side pictures. The sun, sometimes you see it as it is on the left with a lot of 
uh, sunspot activity, and that indicates uh, some prominent magnetic activity on the sun. Sometimes you don't see much, but I want to show you on this next slide. This is starting on July 24th, 2005. This is what the sun looked like from Earth's perspective. And you notice in the left side, the northern hemisphere there, you see a little bit of sunspot activity. And then you look at it the next day. So now I'll advance it to July 25th. And you can see that sunspot has moved. And you start to notice what Galileo noticed is that the sun is rotating. And Galileo was able to see and figure out the speed that the sun rotates. And he figured out that it rotates in about a month. Now, I'll pause it here, August 19th. Astronomers designate with a number every sunspot or sunspot region. The sunspots go in cycles. It's usually about an 11 year cycle. And so when the cycle starts, it goes from no sunspot activity to a lot of sunspot activity and back to no sunspot activity in about 11 years. And so when a new sunspot cycle starts, they designate the first sunspot as sunspot number one, and then number two and number three. This one that uh, the arrow is pointing at just happens to be number 798. And I'm pointing to it because I want you to see it's going to leave the face of the sun as the sun rotates, and then it's going to come around the other side. So let's watch for it as the days go on and it comes around the other side. You notice it's growing as it goes. And there it is again, sunspot 798. It's gone around the back face of the sun, and it's grown much bigger than it was in the beginning. Let's talk about this solar activity, how it varies with time. This is a graph going back to about the year 1900. And you can see, uh, look at the vertical axis, it says, percentage of the sun surface covered by sunspots. So 0.1%, that means one thousandth of the entire sun surface as we see it from Earth covered by sunspots. And then two thousandth, two thousandths, and then three thousandths. So you can see about every 11 years, there's what's called solar minimum. So this is where there's hardly any sunspot activity when it's down low, and then solar maximum when it's at its highest. Now notice that it's not uniform how much of the sun is covered with each solar maximum. So for example, here about the year 1960, there was a very high solar maximum, much solar uh, sunspot activity, about half of a percent of the sun's face covered. And then here, maybe a little after 2000, not nearly as high. So how much sunspot activity there is in each maximum and minimum will vary. And although I said it's about an 11 year period, it's not always 11. On average, it's 11 years. Sometimes it might be about 10 years, sometimes about 12 or 13, but it averages out to about 11 years. So here's that same chart again, the number of sunspots rises and falls in an 11 year cycle. Now this is interesting. If we look at where the sunspots occur, this is a timeline. So you think in 19, little after 1900, right where my pointer is, not much sunspot activity. And then about the year, maybe 1904, sunspots are at relatively higher latitudes. So about 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. And then as the years went on, 1905, 1906, 1907, they tended to be more equatorial. 
So when we get to about the year 1912, 1913, as it's approaching solar minimum, there aren't too many high or any high latitude sunspots anymore. They tend to be focused at the equator. And that's the normal pattern that the sun does. Let's look over at about the year 1960, a little before 1960, where up at the top chart, that's a lot of sunspot activity. And you can see there's some high latitude sunspots past 30 degrees south, past 30 degrees north. And then there's always the trend that they tend to be more equatorial as it goes on. Now, if we take the chart back to when Galileo first started noticing sunspot activity, we can see these regular occurrences about 11 year solar cycle going between maximum and minimum and maximum again. There's this curious time between about 1645 and 1715 where we don't have the ups and downs every 11 years. It's known as the Maunder minimum. So about a 70 year period where there was very little to no sunspot activity and it didn't go through the regular cycles. And astronomers don't know why this occurred, and they think that it happens in uh, many different stars, but uh, we don't know what would cause it, why it caused it, except just that it happened. Now, it is interesting, thinking about the Sun-Earth connection, that during this time of low sunspot activity, the Earth experienced extreme global cooling. And this is a time in history known as the Little Ice Age, where many uh, lakes were frozen over and it was just a time of uh, very massive cooling on the Earth for close to a century. And when astronomers realized this, they started seeing this connection between the Earth's climate, particularly the temperatures, and what the sun's activity is doing. So now we recognize that there is this uh, big connection between the sun's activity and the Earth's climate. As astronomers recognized this 11-year solar cycle, this brought up the question, why does the sun have this 11-year solar cycle? And it has to do with the sun's rotation rate. You look at the picture and it shows the sun in its rotation, but I want you to see that it rotates faster at the equator than it does at the poles. Now, when we talk about the Earth's rotation, the Earth, which is a pretty much a solid ball, it all rotates in 24 hours. But remember, the sun is not a solid. It is a ball of gas or plasma. And so it doesn't need to all rotate at the same rate. At the equator, it goes around in about 25 days. Towards the poles, it goes slower. It goes around in about 35 days. So you can look at the picture on the left and you can see the longer rotation arrows near the equator, and that's representing that it's going faster at the equator. Now look at the pink lines. This is a simplified version of the sun's magnetic fields. Really, the sun has magnetic fields all over the surface coming in and out, and we see those through the sunspots. But this is a simplified version. As the sun rotates with the equator, going faster than the poles, you can see this twisting of the magnetic fields. It drags the magnetic fields around with it. And you can see now it's gotten all twisted up. And when it gets very twisted up, this adds to increasing magnetic activity. And we see this in the form of sunspots. So on the left-hand side of the picture, you can see this represents solar minimum, not too many sunspots when the magnetic fields get all twisted up because of the differential rotation rate of the sun, then you have solar maximum. The sunspot cycle is related to the winding and twisting of the sun's magnetic field. Now in this animation, you can see it's snapping right now. So it goes to solar minimum and they get all twisted up, solar maximum, and at some point it snaps and goes back to normal. And this takes roughly 11 years for it to go from minimum 
which is where it is right here. It goes to maximum increasing sunspot activity, and for some reason, all the magnetic fields snap, and it goes back to solar minimum. What have we learned? What causes solar activity? Stretching and twisting of magnetic field lines near the sun's surface cause solar activity. How does solar activity vary with time? Activity rises and falls with an 11-year period. Now, when I say activity, we can visually most see this with sunspots. But remember, the sunspots are just a visual indication of what's going on in the sun, of the increased magnetic activity. So with that magnetic activity, we get the solar flares and the prominences and the coronal mass ejections. The sunspots do not cause all those things. They're just a good visual indicator of the increased magnetic activity. There is a strong relationship between the sun's activity and the Earth's climate. The Earth's climate is much more complex than what is portrayed in the news media and by politicians. The sun is a dominant cause of change in our climate. If you look at this graph right here, the blue represents global temperatures. And so uh, down on the graph, is uh, lower temperatures, high up is uh, higher temperatures. And this graph goes back to about 1860. And we can see it's down low and then it does uh, kind of up and down, but basically an increase until about 1940. And then there was a cooling period from 1940 to about uh, the mid or late 70s, and then an increasing. And that is related to the length of the solar cycle. Now, length of the solar cycle, if you look over at the vertical axis on the red, I said that a solar cycle is about 11 years, but sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. And so at the top is a short solar cycle, and at the bottom, a long solar cycle. And if we look at the length of the solar cycles, that's the red curve right here, you can see that there is a decent correlation. And so this leads astronomers and scientists to want to study further. What is the relationship between the sun's activity and the Earth's climate? And we do see that strong correlation. That is the end of Chapter 14, Part 3, Solar Activity. Have a great day.